Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. The guests who have come from afar and the public interested in this session. I also want to thank Smart City Expo World Congress for hosting our event. Uh, if you allow me, I will be glad to introduce you to the FAT, the institution that I have the honor of sharing and organize the City to City FAT Award. Uh, for those of you who do not know the FAT, Fostering Arts and Design, is an association of professionals and companies linked to design and creativity with 116 years of history. It's not an overstatement to point out that, ultimately, the aim of the FAT is to improve our environment through arts and design to make people's lives easier, not only functionally, but also emotionally and symbolically. In short, to make people happier. In fact, the City to City Barcelona FAT Award embodies the FAT's essence very well because it's a tool at the service of this cause. An award that was born to track down and enhance the value of initiatives that contribute to improving human life around the world and which has become a platform for connecting cities, projects and people around the common goal year after year, making cities fairer and more habitable. Having welcomed you, I will now give the floor to Pau de Sola Morales, the Vice President of the FAT, who will introduce the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordi, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, as you know, in this edition of the City to City uh, Barcelona FAT Award, the chosen topic was water and the city. And the title of today's session points out there is no city without water because water is a crucial issue in our urban future and even more for our survival as a species. Water has shaped our cities and will continue to do so in the future. Last year, when the jury gave its verdict, they decided that blue communities and Eau de Paris would share the prize. At the time of the decision, they emphasized that both blue communities and Eau de Paris are aligned with the statement made by the United Nations in 2010, highlighting access to water as a universal human right together with the 17 criteria of the organization's sustainable development goals. They also underlined that both projects propose models for the participatory, accessible, and transparent management of common resources. Today, we will have the chance to personally learn in greater depth about one of the two joint winners, the Blue Communities Global Platform, with its director, Mira Karunanantan. Thank you very much, Mira for accepting our invitation. We will also discover the statewide dimension of this subject with Antonio Ramirez, uh, who joins us from a blue community, as, a blue, as the Blue Communities Coordinator of the Spanish Association of Public Supply and Sanitation Operators. We will also look at the European dimension with Pablo Sanchez of the European Public Service Union, and also the local dimension with Maria Jose Chesa, Head of the Environmental Services and External Relations of Becasa, Barcelona's Cicla de l'Aigua S.A. Uh, we will end the session with a debate between all of them, uh, and also Ana Fernandez, Environment Counselor of Cadiz City Hall, who is also here uh, with us tonight. As you can see, there's been few slight changes uh, they are uh, in the final panel of this session. They are due to agenda issues. Uh, 
but basically it remains more or less the same. Um, and it will be a privilege to discover solutions and new points of view for accessing, using, and managing water in our cities with all of them. So thank you again for being here. I leave you now with, uh, with uh, Miriam Planas, spokeswoman for I West Vida, Water is Life, and also a jury member in the City to City Barcelona Fat Award, uh, who will be in charge of introducing all the interventions and conducting the debate from this point on. Thank you very much, Miriam, for accepting our invitation. <clears throat> Hello, so uh, thank you very much, the FAD, for inviting us, IOS Vida, to, condu to conduct this session. It's an honor to give the floor to Mira Ka Karunantan. Uh, there, it's been more than three years or four that we, we have met each other, but I, can st I cannot still pronounce his name. I have troubles with that. <laughs> Sorry, Mira. Um, Today, it's, uh, I think it's more necessary than ever to know about this Blue Planet, Blue Communities project that Mira is uh, r running uh, around the world. Um, today, if you have seen the news in Barcelona, we've known a decision from the Supreme Court of Spain, uh, which cancels the decision from the Supreme Court of Catalonia to cancel the company uh, who, which was created in Barcelona and metropolitan area five years ago. This is a very sad and worrying news for us because this company was created uh, with so many regularities around. We have a deficit of transparency and we need uh, a lot of work to be able to build a water management model with democracy, with transparency, and which uh, is able to let us face the challenges that we have in the, in the future. So I think that projects like Blue Planet Project uh, are more necessary than ever to show how we can uh, imagine um, the water management of the future, how we can put uh, into the table in the, the public water management, the water management that the cities are doing, and we need to keep visualizing that work. And Mira can help us uh, illustrating the work that they are doing. Thank you, Mira. Gracias, Miriam, and uh, thank you to FAD Barcelona for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so it's hard because I don't know who's in the audience. Um, I don't know what backgrounds you all come from. I know some of you. Uh, but I hope it won't shock you or surprise you that those of us on this panel are here to bring a critical perspective to this concept of smart cities. Um, you know, smart is a wonderful word. It sounds great to live in smart cities. Nobody wants to live in stupid cities, right? We all want to live in smart cities. But we should also think about what kind of smart cities we want to live in. Um, and we should think about technology from a critical perspective as well, because it matters who owns the technology and for, and for what end. Um, so when uh, we received, we were thrilled to receive the last year, was it last year, the award from FAD Barcelona, uh, recognizing our work to promote water justice in communities around the world. And uh, FAD, FAD Barcelona makes it explicit that they're not just about innovative and creative solutions for urban problems, they want to create kind and just cities, kind, just, and livable cities. Um, and this is one of the things we're trying to promote through the Blue Communities Project around the issue of water. Um, we all, I hope it doesn't surprise us in this audience when I say technology is a double-edged sword, right? There, technology can be uh, to our benefit and technology can also hurt and exclude uh, and destroy good things. Um, Marx talked about 
commodity fetishism. I, I, would people know what I mean when I say commodity f fetishism? Talked about how the process of creating a con commodity, so you take something that has what we call use value, like water, we, it has a value because we need it, um, and because we use it in our daily lives, and you bring a monetary value to that, uh, you impose what we call an exchange value, and that makes invisible certain processes. It makes invisible the labor um, and the labor cost, the labor pr uh, power that goes into those products. Um, but in today's world, we should also talk about the ways in which environmental and social costs are made invisible um, through, process through technology. Um, and this is, you know, even from the early days when water, public water and sanitation systems were created between the 19th and 20th century, um, it, was first, it was a first process of disconnecting people and communities and cities from the environmental costs. Um, so, you know, where, whereas prior to that, people relied on local water sources, technology allowed for water to be taken from further and further away, right? So it made invisible, we could access clean water after having destroyed water in the local watershed. Um, so we should talk about, in, we should talk about the environmental costs of uh, our city services and the products we can consume. We should also talk about the social ju justice dimensions. We should talk about the social costs of the different systems that we choose um, to implement solutions, um, technological and environmental solutions. Um, because we do know that technologies can also exclude. There's a, I don't know if she's as well known here, but Ursula Franklin, who's a Canadian scholar, physicist, feminist um, talked about technology in the 1990s when she talked about technologies of exclusion and all of the ways in which technology can exclude certain groups of people. Um, and so we need values to shape the solutions um, that we call smart solutions. We need technology in the hands. Uh, we need technology to be driven by a certain set of values. Um, and to us, those values uh, in, the water, in the water sector or the, the, sec the, the, uh, in the group of organizations I represent or the movement of, of, of communities and organizations, we call it water justice. So it brings together both the environmental di dimensions and the social justice dimensions. And the Blue Communities Project was created with this goal in mind of bringing a water justice perspective um, to local water and sanitation services. Um, and we did so in a context, it started as a Canadian project in 2009. Uh, we were dealing in Canada with, we, you know, with Canada has or has been recognized as having one of the best, at least in the urban areas, one of the best public drinking water and sanitation systems in the world. It's primarily in public hands. Um, but we had a, a government at the time because we had infrastructure, there was a strong need as is the case in many parts of the world because of the period in which water and sanitation infrastructure was created, we're in a cycle where that infrastructure needs to be upgraded and improved. Um, and we had a government at that time that was heavily promoting privatization and private financing solutions for municipalities um, and was even threatening to use the mechanisms of funding that were already existing for the central government, the federal government in Canada um, to support infrastructure upgrades to force certain criteria onto municipalities that would force them then to go to private sector solutions. And many communities and many municipalities did not want to take this route. So at the time, we created the Blue Communities Project to address this issue, to talk about how we should shape water governance or local water governments with certain values. Um, and in, in that context in Canada, we decided to, we settled on three, through our consultations with labor unions and communities dealing with water issues, uh, with social justice organizations, uh, human rights organizations. We chose three, set three values or three principles um, that would become then the foundation for the Blue Communities Project. First, that water is a human right. Secondly, that water should be publicly managed and financed. Um, and thirdly, there was a growing push to phase out bottle, so I mean the third 
uh, principle is surrounding this issue of what the commodification of water so um, there was already a big push in Canada we didn't create it but we were involved in the campaign to encourage municipalities to phase out bottled water um, and, and phase out the sale of bottled water in municipal facilities and at municipal events and the idea was simple um, it was the idea that you know, municipalities in Canada were providing some of the best drinking water in the world. Um, and this idea of promoting, which is a recent sort of, it's a recent thing, it's a recent phenomenon to have water um, that is sold in a bottle, right? And that this was not necessary in, in a place like Canada, in cities in Canada. Uh, and also that it created a paradigm shift for people who were used to consuming water as a public service to then start consuming water as a commodity. It created a different relationship with water where people became used to buying and selling water. And so um, there was a big push to encourage municipalities to phase out um, uh, or to ban completely the sale of drinking water uh, or sorry bottled water in municipal buildings and this included you know recreational centers festivals so it really did a lot to generate um, a, a shift in the way people were thinking about water it also was combined with local campaigns then for municipalities to promote public water to uh, dispel some of the myths surrounding public drinking water. So what was happening as well with the bottled water industry and um, and this push for the commodification of water to get encourage people to uh, to drink bottled water was that people needed to find like why would you pay for water? Why would you pay so much more for water that is available free from your tap? Right. So you need to create this idea that tap water is unsafe. Um, and so through this campaign, we were able to dispel those myths because in fact, tap water is tested far more regularly than bottled water. Um, and in fact, bottled water uh, in Canada, I don't know how it is in Spain, but in Canada, it's the um, food and uh, it, you know, it's, it's the agency that looks at food safety, that looks at bottled water and considers bottled water sort of a low risk so it doesn't test it or look at, investigate as much as something like meat products, right? And so, whereas tap water is tested every day, several times a day. Um, and I think this is consistent in Europe. And so, um, this campaign also allowed us to dispel this myth that bottled water was safer um, than tap water. Um, so it was very much also about changing people's relationships to water from citizens um, engaged in, the, in, deci in, in decision making surrounding water, citizens who were concerned about who, uh, who had access to water, who controlled water, um, to, you know, uh, previously people more and more acting as, as consumers, right? So we want to change uh, our relationship from, to water from that of a consumer that, it, that purchases and sells water to citizens who are engaged in decision making, who are concerned about environmental pollution, what happens to water sources. And in parallel in Canada with the Blue Communities Project, we had another project um, to, to get citizens more involved. So whereas the Blue Communities Project was targeting municipalities, we also had local committees where citizens came together to talk about local water issues, to put pressure on local governments to address um, local environmental and social justice issues. So that's around um, bottled water, around privatization. Um, we found that this is the issue that actually made the project much more, um, much more compelling internationally. So something like 2011, what started as a Canadian project um, and, and actually became more and more successful in Canada. So today we have something like 35, between 35 and 40, depending on how you count, uh, municipalities were fully recognized as blue communities. Um, and then we have a number you know, much bigger list of communities that are on their way to becoming blue communities. And we also have, as of this year, our first blue university, McGill University, became a blue university. And it's a similar context with universities where they stop selling bottled water um, 
uh, add, bottle, uh, add, add public wa drinking water fountains again, because this is another thing that happened in schools and universities in Canada, where it used to be that we all had access to, when I went to school, when I was in elementary school, we drank water from fountains. Um, and universities also had fountains. But eventually, you know, with the sale of bottled water, fountains got replaced with bottled water uh, vending machines. So people had to buy, and the fountains were no longer working. So in encouraging public institutions to join the project, we encourage those public institutions to then make fountains accessible to people. So um, in 2011, the project started to generate international in interest. And this wasn't something that we had foreseen initially. We had uh, conceived of it as a Canadian project, but more and more groups working um, to fight privatization primarily internationally um, to fight the ways in which corporations in different parts of the world are seeking access to uh, the water and sanitation sector is a very attractive market to them, right? It's a very attractive market um, uh, because for the mo most part, because a lot of the infrastructure, especially in the global north, has already been uh, built by the public sector. Um, and, and so private corporations were seeking access and people were pushing um, and also we were dealing with, um, you know, in many countries, sort of the advent of right-wing governments, uh, making, it, making it more and, difficult, more and more difficult. There was a shift between groups that were working on national campaigns um, to local campaigns. And so um, more and more groups started to approach us to adopt the project. So it was, it was, a, it was something unforeseen, but very quickly between 2011 and now, we have seen the project grow. So there are now projects, especially all over Europe. So we've got projects in Switzerland, Sweden, uh, in, in Greece. Um, there's now a push to have Milan become a blue community. So there's a project in, in Italy. Um, Paris became a blue community a few years ago. Berlin became a, f a blue community a few years ago. Um, the project is growing in, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, we've also got groups working on the project to promote the blue communities locally in places like Ireland and Turkey. Um, and in Spain, it's run by IOPAS, and we luck fortunately, IOPAS is here to talk about the implementation of the project in Spain. But in Spain, it's been through this wonderful public water operators network, IOPAS, which has linked us to some of the most progressive, visionary water operators across Spain and really around the world. So, um, you know, we had the privilege of having Cadiz become the first uh, blue community, and we have the president of the water company from Cadiz here to speak as well. But Cadiz um, has, is, is for us very much a model of what a blue community can be. Cadiz is a, it, you know, has, an, has, a, has a water, not only a well-functioning public water um, system that serves the needs of its communities, but it's done a lot to democratize water, to socialize water, to engage the public in, um, in, pro in, in uh, understanding the context of the water and saving and protecting water. And as a coastal city, we know that this is really important. And we can learn there are other coastal cities in crisis right now that can learn from the example of Cadiz. I know the most recent uh, campaign, and they've been running a lot of public campaigns. So I went to Cadiz twice already. I hope to go again. But you know, they've also involved a lot of local businesses. So, Whereas in Barcelona, I have a hard time getting public water, tap water at a restaurant. In Cadiz, that's not a problem because the city promote, made these gorgeous vases and gave them to restaurants or jugs, gave them to restaurants. And all of the restaurants are serving water from these Agua de Cadiz uh, beautifully designed jugs. Uh, and it also creates an opportunity to talk with the public about w public water. Um, they also saw the most recent campaign as preventing um, people from throwing, wa uh, throwing garbage into the, um, into the sewage, the, the potholes. Um, and so they have a little slogan um, on top of, and, and you know, uh, uh, La Mara empieza aquí. See, the, 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 the sea begins here. But it allow, you know, these beautiful, creative, artistic projects that engages the public in thinking about, uh, about their water and how to protect their water sources. So one of the, you know, one of the, uh, 
one of the biggest crimes, really, of privatization. It's not just that it allows for private companies to control and make profit from um, the essential services that are fundamental to us living healthy, happy lives. It's also that it individualizes collective responsibilities. It distributes responsibilities onto individuals that should be collective. And it should be collective, especially given the level of inequality that we have right now, right? And so we've seen how private technologies can be used to punish individuals, um, whereas I, I think examples like Cadiz show us how the public sector can use technologies to bring people together, um, to collectivize the responsibility um, in ways that can motivate and, and generate uh, citizenship around water. I'll leave it at that, and we can hear uh, more uh, from the uh, examples of, uh, of blue communities in Spain and in Cadiz uh, from our friends in, who are here from Cadiz and Ayopas. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mira, to share us with to share with us the the project of uh, Blue Communities, a project that I think that it puts value in the public management model in the public water operators, but it also builds networks and tries to put together uh, water operators to share to share the knowledge. And in a, in a world where the knowledge uh, is used to make business, we need more initiatives like Blue Communities to put the knowledge in common, to share the knowledge, to let us improve the infrastructures and the public services that help us reducing these inequalities that Mira was, uh, Mira was pointing. Now, um, I give the floor to Antonio Ramirez. Uh, he's from IOPAS, the Spanish Association of Public Supply and Sanitation Operators. As Mira was saying, they are the ambassadors of the Blue Communities Project in Spain. And he will explain us how they are coordinating this initiative in Spain, uh, what do you need to do if you want to become a Blue Community, and how they are managing this uh, project. Good afternoon. Uh, after the exposition of my meet, Mira, I'm going to explain how we work with the different groups in Spain about they can uh, become to, to be a, a blue community or which thing uh, we develop with them uh, in this way. Uh, our association is the Spanish ambassador uh, of this project. Uh, nowadays, it is a net uh, composite of five entities. Even with uh, there are several city, poros and public uh, operator. The first one uh, was that of Cadiz, uh, and the other entity so enjoyed. Most of us, it's close, a city is a town uh, close to, to Madrid, Huelva in the south of Spain. Medina Sidonia is a, a small city uh, very close from Cadiz, Xavia, in the Mediterranean coast. And here in Barcelona, we have uh, Barcelona Cicla de Agua. But uh, we think that uh, in few, we can enjoy with all of this uh, town, city, or different entity. We think that uh, little by little, we uh, arrive to take uh, a net around all the, the country. But there is not only entity which manage directly the water service. We have some ecologist association, political groups, university, other social group which work with, uh, with international cooperation. Progrifo, the company, 
the comp uh, Prolific uh, campaign is a uh, ProTap. It's the tool we use to develop activity in Blue Community. Uh, we know that uh, tap water has high quality because it's under control through its entry trip. The tap water doesn't generate plastic pollution or consume oil to be supplied. Furthermore, the price of tap water is cheap, close to 1,000 less than bottled water. Finally, thanks to that price, the tap water allows public operator or city hall to help this family, they can pay the bill. But this message doesn't arrive or doesn't reach the society. And why? Until recently, the tap water had a competitor. It was the, the main search. It was the cheapest one. When the trap markets arrived, they started to sell bottled water. They worked very hard to make attractive design, color, ergonomic form, all kinds of water for the same water, to do sport, to children, to restaurant. They create message to promise you, you will be happier, healthier. They have made a lot of advertisement for TV, radio, press, internet, while nothing has been done in favor of tap of water. For this reason, one of the first steps is to create a quality band, brand, sorry, a quality brand. We think that people need to recognize their tap water so that they can define it and ask for quality water service. It's not the brand of the public operator or city hall. We mean the brand of the tap water, the water that we use on the table to have a lunch or to have a dinner. We do this through a design contest to catch the attention of the society about the topic. Why we are making press realize using social network interview or in, on TV, on radio. We are calling different entity which work with the, uh, the art, design, marketing, local culture, all this to catch the attention of the population and of course to generate the brand of the local tap water. Besides of that, we distribute bottles of glass, of stainless steel or other material with low pollution, which can be reused and always with the new brand of tap water. By the other hand, students learn in the school to local water cycling. How they must do a co-reuse of water to reduce this ecological footprint. How they must do, the public operator puts ads and bus on TV, press, internet, social network, telling the quality of the tap water. Also, outdoor activity to show children which products are being a problem in the supply. Infrastructure or citizen, citizen can visit the depuration plant to understand how the water is treated. Everything, action to give the tap water the place where it must be for its quality because because of its ecological, healthy, cheap, and social. As well, we work with the restaurant to the city to offer them jug with, which are used to serve the tap water of customer. We encourage at the public operator or city hall to install fontaine contained, uh, connected directly to the water net inside the building. At the same time, we are increasing the number of the point where people can drink tap water in the street, squares, parks, beaches, sports zone, and so on. To do this, we study the movement of the uh, pedestrians, cyclists, 
and the public transport user to know their routes. Knowing this route, we can install the few from time as possible to give service at the greatest number of people. This jack and bottle of glass of, or stainless steel edited has been donated for the city hall or public operator. All thus can be bought in restaurant which collaborated with Blue Community Project in our website too. The money obtaining, obtaining goes to improve access to water in region with problem of supply. But how media has said, uh, we don't just uh, uh, concentrate the attention in rights awareness. It's not the only field to work in our association. We recently, we have edited a handbook for remunicipalis, the public water service. It has been written by people who work city halls and one of them has been the president of the secretary of City Hall College. We have to think that one of the most important things for the Blue Community Project is the defense of the public management of water service. In this book, we explain the different way to come be uh, the different way that can be taken by the local government to recover the management of the water service. The defense of human rights is other important affair of the blue community. In this case, the association encouraged this uh, partner to develop action that allow universal access to water. Some of them have approved regulation to offer water service family that cannot pay the bill, giving a minimum of 100 liters for water for days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Um, thanks for showing us and bringing us the experience of IOPAS, who's been running uh, for years um, to show us how a water service can be ruled. Um, through the common interest, in favor of the common interest, instead of, of in favor of uh, the interest of a multinational or the um, or to make business, uh, these these uh, experiences that Antonio was sh was sharing with us uh, show us how can you can give a. Uh, get back water to the people with fountains, for example, within, which in some cities have been eradicated with the problems that suppose for people who still nowadays doesn't have the human right to water um, guaranteed. Uh, or other initiatives like the remunicipalization manual, which we have uh, already started the translation and it will, it will be presented in Catalan soon in Catalonia also. And um, now uh, Pablo Sánchez, uh, the spokesperson for European Public Service Union and the representative from EC Right to Water, uh, will talk us about water democratization in Europe. So let's change the scale again and let's go for Europe. Okay. minutes. Well, first, apologize for this round of uh, Spanish accents in English. I think you have been uh, suffering, those of you that come from far away. Uh, I'll thank you for the organizers for having invited us. Um, I will present the organization I represent and I work for. I work for a trade union, a European trade union, that in 2012 launched a European Citizens Initiative. This is a tool ingrained in the European treaties, whereby if a million citizens collect, if a million citizens sign a petition, the European Commission has to act on it, or at least we thought it was that way. 
So we collected 1.9 million signatures in the, month, in the year that we had to do. And, um, and we demanded that this right to water that, is, um, that was voted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2010 would be transposed, applied in the European Union. There are very few countries to say almost none that actually have applied this criteria uh, in their national legislation. The criteria is access to water, uh, affordability, quality, and cultural acceptance. And I think it's very interesting that the FAD gave the prize to the blue communities, and the title is No City Without Water, which means no citizen without water, which means absolutely everyone should actually have access to water. That is actually the idea of the human right to water. So what, what, I mean, you would say, well, most people do, yes? But there are criteria, and we didn't have criteria before 2010, and we do have now. No one should pay more than 3% of their uh, monthly income or, or daily income, depending on the calculations, and the quality of water should have a certain uh, standard. And sometimes we in Europe are a bit complacent with this. We think that this continent is wonderful and so on and so forth. But we have big chunks of the European population that are, do not fulfill the criteria for the human right to water. Let alone to talk about poor people. We have regions like in the Veneto, there are 300,000 Italians that because of uh, chemical uh, spillage into the rivers have actually filtered through and they've been disconnected so that basically the region and the city are providing water every day and there are signs of do not drink the water, you can actually shower. That happens more and more. I mean, if you actually Google water crisis today, you wouldn't have a problem in Ethiopia. The first thing that comes in the search is the Flint water crisis. The second thing that comes is the Detroit water crisis. The, the, the filtering of lead into the ground of Detroit and Flint. Flint was a, is a very important uh, industrial American city where General Motors had its headquarters for many years. It means that the bulk majority of the population of Flint do not have access to water. And the company of Detroit collapsed totally. I mean, the company went bankrupt. It was publicly owned, but badly run. And there was something called the Detroit Water Brigade that were, well, basically illegally connecting people in different neighborhoods to the network because otherwise they could not open the tap. This, this is the world of 2019. I could go on and on with uh, cases like that, like this dystopia. That on the one hand, we have the technology to actually cut a leakage 20, 30, 40 kilometers away from where the company is actually running the system through the smart meters. But in the bulk majority of cases, those smart meters are used to actually cut individuals that cannot afford because it's too expensive. And why it's too expensive? Because water is sold like not as a right, i.e. you get what you need and you pay more if you don't need it and it goes in a scaling, it's actually sold uh, wholesale. The idea of the human right to water is a different approach. It's a different view of a basic resource. And it's not just that you cannot live without water, it's our economy doesn't function without water. The, the bigger consumers and um, the bigger use of, you, of water is in agriculture and industry. It's not the human consumption. We're talking about in the most biggest case, eight, nine percent of the total consumption of a country. The other 90 percent goes into industry, into agriculture. But yet, it's the citizen who has actually gets punished for this, uh, for this system. So our um, campaign wanted to raise this issue, wanted to ask to the European Commission how many people do have a problem with water in this continent. They didn't know. Eurostat doesn't collect any data. And the, after this was in 2012, seven years later, we know that at least 3 million people do not have access to water. You might think it's a low figure, but 20 million are on the risk of disconnection because of quality. So the quality is up, not up to standards of the WHO. And that becomes a decent amount of people. That is the population of Belgium and Portugal put together. So, so as a consequence, the European Commission produced a piece of legislation called the Drinking Water Directive that actually does that. That one of the things that the blue communities is pushing, which is, they call it plastic strategy, is to reduce the production and the consumption of plastic. And here is when the fact that you have a publicly owned, publicly run with a four the society uh, purposed 
company is very useful. We as a campaign, we've been accused very, many, many times by the private sector that we do not like them, and I won't comment on that, but what we have actually seen is that in the water cycle, like in recycling business, if you have, if the municipality, if that is the scale, it can be the metropolitan area, does have control of the entire cycle, there are economies of scale that are made at a huge level. And this is no matter of liking it or not liking it. It's like ch chopping it like a, like a sausage does not bring the know-how to the municipality to think in ecologic terms. So in that sense, we have been promoted and we will promote, and we think we are convinced that remunicipalization and public ownership of the water cycle is, is the way forward, is the smart thing to do. So, and I'll just, I'll put an example. Oops, I've, I've moved the speaker, but there you go, that's not me. Uh, I will put an, an example. Uh, I was in Ireland like a week ago. I think I have to put me back. There you go. Um, this was a publicly owned, publicly run, uh, county based, so local authorities running the system paid through taxation, a very, very specific and special model that for years and years was not invested. There was absolutely no investment. 40% of the water is actually leaked. So of all the water that is transferred from one place to another in the Republic of, in the Republic of Ireland, 40% goes to the landfills. I mean, and it's already, already very wet through the rain, and more there goes through the pipes. But that is actually paid by someone. That cost, because it's, at the end of the day, we're talking about the service, that cost is paid by someone. And that someone was the state, basically, up to the point where the system didn't work, and when the financial crisis came, they were pushed to change the system. So instead of investing in changing the pipes, there are pipes that predate the Republic, so they are pre-19, uh, 19. What they did is to start a program of putting meters. There are no water meters in Ireland. You do not pay according to your consumption. You pay according to your level of uh, income. So you pay through your taxes, like you pay uh, the social security in Spain, or you pay things like this. So it's a very specific, strange system in which if you're rich, you pay more, and if you're poor, you don't pay. Some see it as a very democratic one, but that's what it was which means that there is no level of like you have to spend more or not. There are only um, district meters. So they wanted to put meters per house. Now that was 400 million uh, euros in program that could have actually solved a 30% of the leakage. And this is where the smart choice of, 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 of public policy comes. Instead of putting a meter with the idea of like you're gonna consume less water, with the Irish case, it's interesting. There has been no real proof that actually putting you a meter makes you consume less. It's like your approach to water what makes you consume less. And if you have more income and have better washing machines and have better in, uh, appliances, you actually use less water and less electricity. You're poor, you buy the lowest of the shop. You actually spend more water and more, water and more energy. So there are other elements that come into place. So, and I think this is an important debate is that just a case? But it's an important debate about what is the public policy towards water? What do we want? What do we want? What is our objective? And our objective is, as the slogan says, that no citizen should not be disconnected from the, from the network because they, do not, they cannot afford it, afford it. We need to build solidarity messages. This is not a matter of charity. This is a matter of the fabric of our society. If we, can, if we have five to 10% of our society that do not have access to water, it means that they are very likely not living in a very healthy uh, um, dwelling, and they will probably pay for electricity either. So I think that technology here needs to be put to raise the level of society so we, we, our societies do not break down. And the case of Flint and Detroit are actually very interesting. When a society can provide for absolutely everyone the basic things such as water, heating, and housing, I'm not gonna go into housing in this country, but we could, or in the city, but is will break down. And I think technology needs here to be put to the benefit of the majority, in that, sen in that sense, water to absolutely everyone in our society. The human right to water 
declaration of 2010 tries to do that, tries to say, well, these are the criteria, public or private, we don't really care. Personally, I think that the cycle allows you to do a lot of economies of scale. But so far, there's only been one country who changed the constitution to actually take this into account. That was a big victory for, for us in 2015. Slovenia, through the parliament, changed the constitution to recognize the human right to water as a part of the constitutional uh, infrastructure. Now they don't have a law that applies it, but it allows a debate to say what type of society are we in that does not allow everyone to have uh, water when they need it water for, the, for the members of the family. So we will continue to do that. We welcome a lot the, the, the Blue Community's effort. We welcome a lot that the, the debate on water and water ownership is now on the table at the European level, at the global level, and we will continue to campaign to achieve what we want is the human right to water for every, every single citizen in this planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo, uh, for these illustrative cases uh, that help us uh, to see some of the weird situations we have to face some, sometimes and more, more often than what we would like. Um, now, uh, Maria Jose Chesa from Becasa, Barcelona, Cicla de Laigua. She's the head of environmental services and external relations. She, and she will speak about um, what are the, the strategies and the projects and policies that Barcelona Cicla del Agua is uh, going on, is, is having going on right now? Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, Miriam. On behalf of Barcelona Water Cycle and the Municipality of Barcelona, we would like to thank the organization of this event for offering, for offering us the opportunity to present the Alternative Water Resources Master Plan of Barcelona, PLARAP. Um, why Barcelona need this master plan? because water is a scarce resource worldwide. In Barcelona, the risk of meteorological drought is endemic and recurrent. The objective of this master plan is reduce the use of drinking water for, is replace the use of drinking water for other alternative water resources in those use, in those use uh, that not require the, um, the quality of the drinking water. For its use, achieve the best resource, proximity, quality, and ensuring the maximum efficiency and guaranteeing the good ecological state, status of the aquatic ecosystem. How? Identifying and updating the quantitative and qualitative data of available resources, groundwater, reclaimed water, rainwater, green water, and seawater. Then analyzing the demand for its use and performing an, an, an analysis between quantity and quality of resources and the demand of the city. And then creating action lines to use these resources available in the city. Climate projections show us the increase of dry periods. Uh, we had uh, the last period in 2007, and there is no, no water to drink in this uh, 10 years ago. It was very hard for, for our city. Other projections show that uh, there will be um, a reduction of the annual rainfall average. On the other hand, there will be more, ep more episodes with a high intensity of rainfall. The guarantee of water supply for the metropolitan area of Barcelona is only for one year. And this is a hard vulnerability for this area. C climate predictions in the passive F scenario forecast an increase, an increase 
of the drinking water needs for the area of Barcelona in 18 cubic hectometers by year. This is a, a hard problem for us. In, in order to solve this vulnerability, this uh, endemic problem, the municipality of Barcelona uh, make this master plan. At the, at the beginning, we study the municipal demand for each use in order to substitute the drinking water consumption for other resources that the quality could be en enough. Then we make a matrix between the av av available resources and the possible uses for all the city, not only, munici not only the municipality consumption. And then we um, establish different action lines in order to make real this substitution of the drinking water and reduce the water consumption of all the city. The um, uh, use of, of rainwater for the municipal municipality of Barcelona um, to, to watering the, the green spaces, clean streets, and other uses that don't need the, the quality of the drinking water um, uh, start 20 years ago. And now, with this master plan, we, we, um, the objectives are improve the control and the management of the, the current installation and extend it the network in the other places that at this, at this time is, is very difficult. This, is, uh, this map uh, shows the, um, the municipal groundwater network, the existing um, installations, and the, and the new ones. You can see the pic well, uh, <laughs> this, um, this slide explains the, um, the reclaimed water the use of the, the purified water from the um, wastewater, um, wastewater treatment plant of the Llobregat, because it's a an, is an, is an resource that we can have each year 50 cubic hectometers, and you can, you can, it's possible to use this, this resource for um, mm, the same, the same uses, municipal uses and private uses, like uh, irrigation of uh, green spaces or cleaning streets or, or, or these uses that don't need the, the quality, the same quality of the tap water. The, the third action line is the promotion of the gray water uses in, in domestic sector, in commercial sector, because it's, an, it's an, uh, a local uh, resource, and we can, we can save in, in houses the 30% of the water consumption. And, and now the technology is, is an old and is cheaper than, than in the past, and Barcelona is thinking now uh, a plan in order to uh, make possible this action line in the new in the new buildings. It it could be um, you must do this installation in order to reduce the water consumption. There are, there is another action line in order to have the the catchment of the rainwater in the in the roof of the buildings because it is an, another uh, resource that the um, the quality. The, um, is is uh, is um, is a good is a good quality more the other uh, types of resources, and there is another benefit important benefit that reduce the quantity of rainfall go to the sewage system and then to the wastewater tr treatment plant. Another action line is to to have the the catchment in the the mountains of Colcerola and is a, a possibility 
um, that uh, the proposed action are the construction of, of 10 retention tanks in order to, to use for, for municipal uses. And the, the last uh, action line is the um, promotion of, the, of sustainable urban dinage. Uh, this, um, this solution um, uh, promotes the, uh, an, uh, a solution uh, that um, naturalizes the, the water cycle in the city. And other benefits are the, the protection of the water bodies, the groundwater, the surface, and, and uh, we can increase the, the volume of water or rainwater that it could, could be um, used in the green spaces. And there are other uh, benefits like the reduction of the um, heat islands. The, uh, uh, it could be an important tool to, to increase the biodiversity in cities. And the objective in Barcelona is to manage the, the rainfall up to uh, 15 um, millimeters. And with these techniques, we can manage the 80% of the rainfall in the, um, in the year. This is the, um, the different, um, the main criteria that we, we have in Barcelona to uh, promote this sustainable urban drainage. Different uh, types of uh, studies that we have made in the, uh, in the uh, in different uh, neighborhoods of Barcelona, because Barcelona is not flat. There are different um, parts of Barcelona that it could be very easy to implement these techniques, but we, we, we need to consider this. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. I like to summarize by, by saying water is an scarce resource worldwide. In Barcelona, the risk of meteorological drought is endemic and recurrent. The Alternative Water Resources Master Plan of Barcelona, PLARAP, replaced the use of drinking water for other water resources. And finally, Barcelona without groundwater, reclaimed water um, from wastewater, grey water, rainwater, uh, sustainable urban drainage, seawater, all this kind of water with, without uh, them. Barcelona cannot be sustainable. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Maria Jose. Um, now I will invite all the speakers and also Ana, Ana Castillo, I don't want to be, Ana Fernandez, from president, the president of Aguas de Cádiz, to join me in this uh, seat. As you want. I have my jacket there, so I will sit there. I think, yes. Sure. Um, thank you, Maria Jose, for all these initiatives that you are um, ruling from Becasa. Um, sometimes I think that. We need to go also to think into the roots of the of the problems we and the challenges we are facing. Because uh, Barcelona is implementing all these fantastic initiatives, but now we are in Hospitalet, in La Fira, and in Hospitalet there is a plan to end with the last hectares uh, of agric agricultural land that they have in the city. So. Sometimes they are planning to build more buildings in this agricultural space, which is used by the citizens, and which there is a platform which is fighting to, to maintain it. And on the other side, once we have finished with this uh, agricultural lands, then we need to renaturalize it. So sometimes we need to think about all these, initi all these new initiatives to, to, bring, the bring, to the, bring the green to the city, but we also need to think on the public policies we are doing. And sometimes we need to put limits to the growth, in this case of the 
uh, buildings and the need to, to build new things. Because otherwise, then in the future, 20 years uh, ahead, we'll need to go back and renaturalize it. So, and in this sense, uh, most of you have named some of the challenges we are uh, facing regarding water. But um, I would like you to, to name and explain a little bit which are the main challenges from your project or your perspective that uh, water is uh, the, in the water sector we are facing and we need to give a response to. If Mira wants to start, maybe? Um, okay. I mean, so there are several challenges. We've heard and talked about the increasing threat of privatization. The other thing to consider specifically in this forum is what we call market environmentalism. Right? So when we were thinking about the three basic principles that need to guide our, uh, our project or the management of local water resources, we talked about human rights and the human right to water, public management, um, and then challenging the commodification of water through bottled water. It's really important in this context where we've got corporations increasingly claiming to have the solutions for the environmental crisis that more and more young people are getting angry and anxious about. So we're seeing more and more young people in the streets fighting the impacts of climate change. And, you know, corporations are smart. The neoliberal economic model is smart in terms of being flexible and adaptable and being able to try and address that challenge. So we're seeing a growth in this model that we call market environmentalism. So finding ways in which corporations in the market can claim to solve the problem. And, and as I said earlier, the impacts are not faced equally around the world, right? We know in the global south, we know if you're African American, like Detroit and Flint, the thing about Detroit and Flint is that they're predominantly African American cities, right? So, or if you're indigenous in Canada, you're going to feel the impacts of environmental crisis much more strongly. Um, and um, and so uh, what market, market environmentalism does is it hides the social impacts of the water crisis. And what we try and do by, by imposing human rights as a criteria, by imposing, is, is to visibilize the human impacts, to visibilize the extent of dispossession of the crisis. And so what happens, so in terms of, you know, just to give you a sense of the threat of market environmentalism and what's happening around the world, another process we've been following is the ways in which corporations and particularly in the global south have positioned themselves as leaders uh, when it comes to environmental solutions particularly around the water crisis so there's a group called the 2030 water resources group so it's basically coca-cola nestle pepsi Rio Tinto, all these big corporations that are involved in struggles with communities at the local level in the global south, working with the World Bank. So that it's, 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 a, it's a platform that was created by the World Bank at the World Economic Forum um, to enable these corporations to work with governments in the global south. So it's happening in South Africa, in Brazil, in India, um, throughout the Middle East, uh, in China. So these the World Bank is allowing these corporations to set themselves up as experts on the water crisis and then influence government in developing water policy. So this is where, um, and of course the kind of water policy then that they're promoting is what we call market-based solutions. So they don't want regulation of water, they want to set up what they call uh, water trading rights. They want the market to decide how water is distributed, right? Why go through, if you're Coca-Cola and you want access to local water, why go through a government and why go through a complicated regulatory process um, that's then also made transparent to the public and the public can fight back? Why not just set up water markets so you can buy and sell water rights, right? So this is the model that has like destroyed water resources in Chile. Um, and rather than learning from that example, we want to promote it in South Africa and in India, everywhere around the world. So um, what the blue community sets up to do is to set up solutions to getting 
communities involved and local in monitoring water from a human rights perspective and protecting public ownership so that local governments maintain their control and not give it up to corporations who are fighting at the national level to gain control over water. Do you want to? Yes, uh, I wanted to say our, in our campaign, uh, we speak all the time to the, the high quality of the tap water. But it doesn't mean that the people have to, to spend water in all things in, in their house. We just want to say that uh, the people have to make a, a responsible consume in their house. Now we are working in a, a plan to manage the, the dry in the city. Uh, in this plan, we, uh, we put the society to uh, promote any activity to, to lower the consumer. Uh, by the other side, uh, we uh, encourage to the society to don't uh, take a, bot a water bottle just because of the pollution. Uh, in all uh, our city, we have a, a problem. And in the school, we show the, the children uh, which is the, the problem of uh, the plastic in the river, in the forest, or in the sea. Good afternoon. Well, I'm Aubrey uh, with uh, all my partners. Uh, there is a, a water crisis. It's different in different places, but uh, we need to to fight basically for the 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 right of the water. This is the fight. Uh, different in different places, but this is the, this is the the fight. Uh, private water or public water. And we need to uh, fight together because uh, we think that the, the water is a human right. It has to be this way. And from uh, every place, we need to, to make this uh, right uh, with the different places. Uh, teaching uh, people uh, in our city, uh, teaching uh, students in the schools to use the tap water and with the different uh, uh, um, Make it to to be uh, to make the the this fight uh, real and, and believe in real this uh, uh, right um, has to be the the water like a, a human right. Yes, uh, sorry to repeat the Irish thing. I've been uh, I had to go to Ireland very many times in the last uh, 16 mo 18 months, so. Uh, just on this issue, I think what the climate crisis is going to have as an impact on the water sector, uh, on our societies if you want, is that we're going to see strange and bizarre developments. Right, as the Irish case, I mean, in Barcelona had drought. Last summer, Ireland, Ireland went through a drought, which is already a historic event in itself. It snowed, and in the winter, in Dublin, most of the population, what they did is they switch on the taps with hot water because they fear, never, it never snows in Ireland, really. It's, it's very Atlantic, rains a lot, but it never really goes below, beyond, beyond minus one, minus two. That was a huge storm. The island was isolated. And most, the popul most of the population of the city, because they fear that the pipes would explode, being frozen, they opened the taps and they emptied the reservoir of the city. They, they, they just did. So they had to cut the flow for the next two months. I went to a, to a hotel, opened the shower, and it was like, it's like well, so I went down and it's like, well, they, they're cutting the flow because people feared that the pipes would explode. So they opened the hot water for two days running. Well, of course, not having to pay. That was uh, actually a not uh, silly move in the sense of like, I don't pay according to consumption. My pipes are gonna explode and I'm gonna have to pay for them. So, hot water. So most pipes didn't explode. The city ran out of water. Now that raised against the issue of like, what is our public management? And the problem here was investment because everything in the island has been underinvested. 
um, it's very welcome that today the European Commission is pushing some countries, not this one, to actually in, in, increase investment. Most cont developed countries in the world, the infrastructure is crumbling. So it's a very paradoxic, paradoxic moment in which we're facing a climate crisis. We know things are happening. We saw Venice. Everyone saw Venice. I mean, the more obvious case of uh, water stress is Venice. The second is uh, the Netherlands. That is totally under the water. But at the same time, there is no public planning. And I think this is the challenge. The challenge is that we see things like snow in Ireland, but there are no concrete measures taken to actually tackle that. There are good intentions, but when, we come down, when it comes down to the real policy plan of, okay, we need to do this or we need to do that, it comes down of what Mira was saying, we will leave the market to see if it solves the problem, which to me personally, it seems like we are in the Middle Ages. When we turn to the church and we put a candle and we hope that the market will solve all our problems. But the issue is that we are where we are because of this, the, uh, the laissez-faire that has been the issue. So I think the real challenge is not so much climate change, but the, the fact that we basically using the very same recipes that actually created the problem as solution. And now we see these in the, in the, in the negotiations, in the, in the international negotiations at the COP 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. It's going to be a total disaster because it's badly organized. But I think that is the, I mean, climate crisis is a problem, but it's more problematic the approach that we as humans, governments more responsible than the citizens, are actually proposing. I think this is the real issue. Um, I think that the, the Barcelona model, in order to have in a, in a public operator all the, all the services, the, the supply of the alternative water resources, the management of the sewage, uh, of the sewage network, the management of the, of the coast, of the quality of beaches, could help cities to, to improve and to optimize the, the, the budget of the services and, and have a more resilience about the problem that climate change uh, could, uh, in the future, we, we have to, to fight the, the severe droughts, uh, the, the lack of, 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 of water, and it could be a, a good model that uh, cities have this, this kind of operators la, uh, as uh, Barcelona Water Cycle. Thank you to all. You named very different uh, challenges, but some names, no? climate emergency, uh, human right to water and sanitation, uh, governance and control of the water service from a public service perspective, um, but also involvement of the community. No? Uh, how do you think we could, because I would like, Mira mentioned the concept, and Pablo, the, the concept of smart cities conference, and we are also quite skeptic about it. I think we need to do smart cities, as Mira was saying, but we need to take smart decisions, as Pablo was saying. And from my Westbida perspective, we, th we think we need to, to help citizens to be, not become, because people is already smart, but we need technology to help them have the data they need to have. So I don't know if you have ideas on how to build this citizen involvement, this community involvement, this uh, public uh, control and how the smart cities can can help us to do that, no? Which strategies, which projects, which challenges do we have? And if Blue Planet Project is uh, thinking about that? Somebody wants to start? Or? Well, uh, certainly uh, in the Blue Community Project, uh, we just only uh, put uh, the high quality of tap water 
in the place uh, which have to do we have to be but uh, we try to to make with all our partner uh, uh, management uh, with uh, transparent uh, try to to come the people participate here in, in in the all decision in the entity uh, because we think that the only way uh, to develop all rule or um, normative around the, the management of the water is to uh, get into the, the society of uh, the management. Uh, we encourage at all our partners to, to do uh, this in this way. So, I mean, I'll let others talk about smart initiatives and how technology can help. Uh, and my friend Luis is probably going to say, I focus on the negative. <laughs> so, I, I'll let Iopas and others talk about the positive. But, um, you know, often we shouldn't undermine the like, low tech solutions as well, right? Because there is still a very big digital divide. And sometimes when we smarten up the services that are essential for people's lives and well being, we're excluding people who fall on the other side of this digital divide. I also work a lot in communities in the global south. People don't have access to computers. So you can digitize and make everything, uh, you know you know, high tech, but you know, people don't have necessarily access to the tools that would give them access to those technologies. We also know that technological de development is driven by, I mean, not, not just capitalism and profit, but also patriarchy and other negative things, racism, colonialism. I've been to this tiny little village in Morocco where you know, everybody had smartphones, but women didn't have, like they had, they were still using a very old uh, kind of oven to, br to bake the bread that was actually making them blind, like it was making them lose their vision. So they didn't have the technology to, fa to, to support women in a very basic everyday, you know, because of the division of labor and women were, were baking the bread, but everybody had smartphones. So technologies aren't always driven in ways that uh, are, you know, feminist and social justice oriented. And so, yes, we should push to develop technologies in that direction and have ways to, uh, to, to promote that. But at the same time, uh, w you know, there are also low tech solutions that are more accessible. Um, and I don't even think that, you know, if we look at in the water sector, what we need, sometimes it's not the, the most sophisticated technology because uh, a lot of the technologies that we are promoting and calling for in have existed for a long time um, you know uh, there was a huge development in the 19th 20th century in the water sector to provide uh, water uh, and sanitation services and a lot of those technologies are sufficient we don't need the most sophisticated technology we need technologies that are accessible um, as well uh, personally I'm a great defender of technology so this is for start uh, but I agree with Mira. I mean, um, the problem with the smart city concept is that it's, it's not very intuitive. I mean, an inclusive city would be an ins a city that takes everyone in. So if you have like 50% of the population sleeping in the streets, it's not an inclusive city. So all right. if you have like everyone has a house and, and there is 0% uh, unemployment rate, it's an inclusive city. So you, you have an element, or, or, let's say an objective element to, 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 to judge how smart is your city? Now, of course, no one wants to live in an idiot city, but w what does it mean? It's a non-functional one. So it's the functionality. Is So that, that is the problem with the thing. The thing is, for many years, the smartness was directly linked with the technological use. Very good. I mean, I... As a, as a fundamental, as a principle, I think more technology can help the human race. Now, the technology needs to be for a purpose. And that, thing is the, our our campaign is to actually get this criteria because I mean you can have I mean there's always debates in this about the space race the space race has given many very many things to the common day life that are very useful now do we need to use spaceships to put rich people to go to bury them 
That, that's not very smart, as, as far as I'm concerned. It's very smart use of technology. We should use the space missions to, I don't know, throw nuclear waste, uh, not throw Jeff Bezos. Well, maybe Jeff Bezos should be thrown live, and then that would be a, an actually a smart move. But uh, I, I think that is the criteria that we need to actually, we're missing here. We, we, we have, we're living in the, the very beginning of a new technological era, but we haven't put the very clear criteria, and that can actually become a dystopia. Now, I work for a trade union, and we are very old organizations, not very smart, uh, many people would say, but the previous uh, technological revolution that we had actually was through organizations like I work, and most of organizations that I deal with were born at that time, that actually fought for mass transportation for everyone. Uh, water access, electricity, gas, there was a, everyone should actually have access to hot water. That was a very revolutionary at the time. But now the debate is like everyone should have broadband. Broadband should be a public service. And the, it's, I'm happy Leeds is here because in the UK there is actually a big debate about this. I mean, it's who owns the technology owns a, has a lot of advantages. So if the technology is owned by the municipality, there is a democratic control over the technology. If the technology is owned by Facebook, Google, and Amazon, we have an issue. Unless you are a shareholder of Facebook, Google, and Amazon. I would assume that none of you are. And if you are, good luck for you. But for the rest of us, I think it's an important element that we actually have this debate about the criteria. So yes, smart. But without a very clear definition, anything and everything can be smart. And I, again, you know, low, you know, there's also use of a smart of a smart approach, let's say, not to use the most sophisticated thing for something. I mean, in the water sector, and I'll finish with this, you would have the big companies saying, we need membranes, and we need like uh, yeah, membranes to clean off nanoplastics within the water. But the question is posed, do we need nanoplastics in the first place? What are we throwing to our water? I mean, do we need to actually throw all these chemicals? Can we not do away without throwing them to the water and then we don't have to do all the, so much uh, sanitation with all those chemicals? I mean, is, is it not better not to do it? Like the very famous example of the Soviet and the American race to actually note in the, you know that, huh? so the Americans and the Soviet Union were competing for the space race and the Americans were trying to develop a pen, you know, ball pens with no gravity, the, the, the ink doesn't come in and they spend a huge process to go through and the Soviet Union, they gave, I mean, the Soviet answer was us, give a pencil that you don't have to, uh, to, to develop. Now, of course, the development of that was a great improvement for pencils and pens and so on. But I mean, as a quick solution for the problems that we have, and I come back to the climate crisis, we don't always need the most developed technological thing to actually provide with the minimum standards to all. Sorry to... Yeah, um, I am agree with two ideas. One is uh, uh, a blue community is a smart community, but uh, and and we need uh, the technology, of course, but uh, this technology has to work for um, for two for two things. One, um, um, make the people uh, uh, being. Uh, Sea capaz de participar, uh, being capable uh, to make uh, uh, in, in, in different process of, of make decision. Uh, the people had have uh, to be uh, uh, asked for the, the the things and have to be uh, um, uh, opinion about the things. And the technology have to facilitate this kind of uh, of things. Uh, we need uh, 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 the people asking and, and, and uh, taking decision about uh, this kind of things like the water. And this technology uh, has to be this objective uh, 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 of UFTs, I'm sorry, uh, because uh, uh, this has to be the, the, the mission of the technology. Uh, in, 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 and we, we, I think in, in blue communities in, in, in Spain, we are using the technology uh, for, for this, um, that is the way. Mm. Uh, sorry for my, for my English. <laughs> 
I, th I think that technology can help uh, to improve the the the, um, the water the urban water cycle, but we need the um, complicity, the collaboration of the citizens, the user of the water cycle. For example, here in in Europe, we have now the problem of the improper um, flushable, um, like uh, wet wipes or um, um, hygienic products that people don't think that it is impossible to flush inside the, the water clothes, the sewer system. And if you, if you know, the last month in the newspaper, London has the big second fat bear with the size with, an, with a bus, and it's a huge problem in all Europe. And we have a smart technology and all, but we need the the complicity, the ethical behavior of all the all the citizens. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to. Thank you to all. <laughs> I don't need to micros. Um, now, uh, if you want, maybe it's time to give the floor to uh, the audience. If you want to make uh, some questions, we have 12 minutes late. Maybe we have we can have two or three questions, if you want to. If there is no questions, let's wait. Ah, vale. Uno, uno, quizá ya está. Casi. Well, um, thanks all the speakers for this interesting and inspiring session. Um, it's just a reflection and maybe you can, um, uh, well, I don't know, uh, what is your considerations, but uh, I've been working in household water treatments in rural areas in the Global South and it's very beautiful to see how the technology, in this case the low technology, uh, contributes to the empower empowerment of the community to recover knowledge how to deal with water in their communities, not only to have cleaner water, but also to know how to clean their waters. No? So this uh, approach to the, to the source, to, to, to the, the elemental no? water. And in cities, is my reflection no? that uh, the management is in the municipality. It's like a big thing that we is so far from the individuals and people. To I, I'm thinking how to um, to increase conscience on the water management and how to increase a little bit. Not because of course everyone no, or justice and social justice is in everyone's voice, no? But what about water? Because it's so far, no? People start to grow their vegetables in their home, no? And like, starts to, to, to fill the, the source, but not in water, it's in a tap, it's so far. I don't know if maybe in blue communities you have experience on how uh, in urban, no? in cities, these um, conscious can go back to the people not only because the politician on this time no things on on that but what about the the community let's wait i think there was another question and and then we can answer both yes i was thinking about how i will ask it because my english is not that good too um I was expecting to see more solutions on the expo about the, the theme of the water and the topic of the water on the urban environment because I think it's, it's how she was saying, it's really far, it's underground, it's an invisible thing to the society. So I want to know from you, um, why do you think that we are not discussing the, the theme of the urban water so hard that uh, we are discussing the, the theme of the energy or solutions for the urban lightning and I don't know I have there there is a lot of examples of uh, solutions for um, all the themes we we can imagine but not uh, a lot of um, examples of solutions with uh, the managing of the water it's clear 
Yeah, it's clear. Okay. So if there is no more questions, maybe we you, we can start a round, a final round of interventions because we have eight minutes late. Okay, I want to answer the first question. Thank you. I am surprised that you are you you, you see interest in my exposition with my English. <laughs> but uh, in the school, we try to to show the uh, cycle of water local. It's so important because uh, we always say that we have to say the name of the tap sorry, the, the dump or the river where come from the water because people have to know that they are using a water from any place. It's not a, a, a abstract thing. And they consume a, a fed a, at the cycle. And this is very important because uh, the children doesn't uh, have this idea at the beginning. You learn when you are more uh, older, but not the, uh, at the beginning. And for example, in Barcelona, there is a, um, a platform. Uh, if you Google La Fabrica del Sol, in English, the, the sound the machine, sun fabric or La Fabrica del Sol, uh, you can factory. you can the factory <laughs> okay um, you can find a program that it's called how Barcelona works and you can visit all the installation of the water cycle you can go inside the sewage system it's fascinating if you don't have been there it's, it's an interesting visit and then you can visit the storm water uh, store water tanks <coughs> and then the magical fountain and you have an explanation for, for this, this program is prepared for, for families, for individuals, also for schools or, I don't know, for groups in the civic centers of Barcelona. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function of, of our company to explain how the, the the, diffic the difficulties, the challenge, the budget that we need to manage all, and is is necessary. Okay, so two qu so the question of why there are more solutions or why we're talking more about the environment, the atmosphere, energy, and not uh, water, and then how do we make water less abstract for people living in a urban areas, right? Or how to make it closer to people. Um, I mean, I think there are lots of theories about, but one, one is that, you know, you can produce new forms of energy or you can, you know, or, but water, there, I mean, you can talk about alternative energies, but, you know, the, as the saying goes, there's no alternative, you know, water to a certain extent, right? Because, you know, you could also argue that desalination is one method of finding new sources of water by cleaning seawater. But water, fresh water for the most part is a limited resource and you can't create more water. So it's mostly a problem of shifting, it's mostly about shifting the problem around. So all of the technologies are about shifting the problem around. So even with desalination, you know, we're talking about uh, you can you can clean seawater and make it available, but at what cost, right? And who's going to then pay that cost? They, uh, you know, in some countries of the north uh, of the global north, it might be in some cities it might be feasible, but you know, it, it's being promoted. For example, the other city that supposedly ran out of water, or at least was very. Um, uh, low in its water reserves was Cape Town. Last year, there was a big crisis in Cape Town that people would have heard of. And so desalination has been promoted in Cape Town as a solution. But desalination, desalinated water, a lot of the scientists who did some some preliminary analysis were saying it's a bad idea for Cape Town. Uh, one, you know, it creates this byproduct that then just, that is then dumped back into the sea. They were also saying the sea actually around Cape Town is really, really dirty. Um, and so you're actually then treating a lot of human waste again um, and, and a lot of chemicals in the seawater. Um, and it makes that water 
eight times at least more expensive than actually using fresh water. So, you know, sometimes technology, what it does is it allows us to ignore the problems and also uh, shift the cost. Then who is going to pay that cost? Who is going to be able to access water that is so expensive and who's going to be excluded in a city where there's already very high levels of uh, inequality? And in terms of you know, making visible water in urban areas. I think that's also going to be less and less. Like if you look at, you know, uh, Santiago, for example, there were water shortages, Cape Town. I mean, these are cities of big cities of the global south. Delhi, they're talking about running out of water. You know, we heard the uh, in Ireland, uh, was it Dublin? You know, but that more and more with climate change, it, water scarcity is becoming a real issue for people. Um, and Again, what I said earlier, you know, about collectivizing the the responsibility. So, you know, with a public system, you know, and again, I talked about the example of Cadiz in making visible the water through their public campaigns and engaging the community uh, in in becoming conscious of their water source. Um, and because they're, they, it is a city that has had water shortages or is dealing with, right, it's, it's a critical kind of context. It's not a city with like unlimited amounts of water, right? And so getting the community involved through a public water system versus some of the, the, the technological solutions that would again transfer the responsibility to individuals through meters. Um, so if you can pay more, you can consume more, but if you can't pay, then you can't consume very much. Um, that we need kind of, collect. yes, it's something we still need to talk about and improve. I'm not saying the solution exists, but I do think you know, the criteria we establish provide some of the basic, like we, if we're gonna talk about how we responsibilize everybody, make everybody responsible, uh, you know, it needs to be public. We need to also consider human rights criteria. We need to challenge the commodification of water. Then we could talk about collective solutions, but not, not before that. Well, in, in Cadiz, like uh, public management, uh, we have a web. You can write uh, Aguas de Cadiz in Google, and you have a, a lot of information about uh, uh, whatever we have. Uh, we are working uh, uh, about human uh, water rights uh, in, in Cadiz. Uh, since uh, uh, where are the, the fontaine? We have. Uh, uh, 100 fontaine and uh, we have one for every uh, minute walking uh, and the uh, minimum water vital uh, and all the projects we are working uh, it's easy to, to learn easy to, to to find and the information is is, is open for the for the person for the uh, people uh, to 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 ask to read and to learn and then uh, have an opinion about uh, we are working uh, on it is important that the people have this information uh, in, in in this way we think it's very very important 50 seconds of speech time eh? I switch <laughs> off um, you know when you realize how important is water when you don't have and that is why yeah, yeah. we have had such an up surge of people in some countries like in southern Spain like in Greece during the crisis like in Ireland during the crisis like in Italy in 2010 with the referendum because there was the fear I mean where you lost your job and you have very little to live and then there is a bill that comes in and it's like you cannot afford it and you ask for money the next bill you're gonna have an issue and then it's when loads of people that know someone like this, it becomes it's like, oh, what? I mean, that is when it becomes. Now, one of the things of being in Brussels is that no one cares about you, but you get to visit other places and then you can explain things. Paris is a bit of a pity that they were not here, but it's when they remunicipalized, every single fountain, there is a thing that explains you where this water comes from. How many plastic per year are we saving actually having a, a, and now because it's municipal and the city manages education, everyone goes through the, the water uh, station that they created a little museum, that you do that, you, you, you have a, now, second point, why a privately owned company, how is it that they not do a campaign of promotion so you, don't, you consume less? Because if you consume less, your bill goes down, and the profits go down. 
Now, a publicly owned company can shoot on their own feet and say, right, hey, you need to consume less water because there is drought and so on and so forth. And even if we have uh, losses at the end of the year, it doesn't matter because we have a, a greater goal or the city would put the money. So that is also why you would not see companies that run the business promoting less consumption. It's actually against the business model. Hence, this logic of we need this to be not for profit, but for the community, for society, for everyone, hence the right. So I think when you have a different approach, you want to explain to people where the water comes from, where is the water station. I think everyone should be compulsory go to a sewage plant and see how the dirty water is clean and see how the process works. Everyone should, every kid should go. I mean, every kid should learn how to, like some driving things and then should do that. But if you work with the city or with the one that manages a school, which is the same authority, it's much easier. I mean, really, the model of Paris, in which if there is works, there is a placard that explains we're doing this and this and this and it, yes, yes. and sending, sending uh, letters to, with the bill saying you're paying this for this reason with this purpose. I mean, if in, in this country, the electricity company would send you See a it. letter explaining how you pay, there'd be an uprising the day after because there's all taxes and, 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 and I think it's a, a way, an important way to do. And it actually explains that. I want to finish with one point. In Europe, we still do not have a market for water. Is it still the local authority or the regional authority or the member state, if it's a small place like Malta, that decides how the, man the water is managed? That's how or why you do not get these macro solutions because it's still very ingrained in the local situation. And as Mira said, it's still a resource. And it's a resource that at the end of the day, has to be divided in some sort of way, hence the issue of, of governance. So I think it's important that this is explained. This is a resource. It's not like an endless resource. It's not like the sun. Well, it might one day explode, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. It's really a resource that we, if we do not divide it in a democratic way, we're going to have a societal issue. OK, if uh, it's fine for all the participants, we will leave it here. Thank you very much to all of you for sharing your experiences and your visions on water and on your projects. And thank you to FAT for organizing this roundtable and this conference. Thanks.